Hello and welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts Lucy Davis and Benjamin Holden. Today we have a super special guest, fastest woman ever. Honestly, I mean, actually, we should definitely do a YouTube video together. But we have Asha Philip on today, and we are so excited. How are you doing? Eh? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. I'm really good. I had a great day. The weather's not too bad, so yeah. I appreciate I know, you first on. time in London, I feel like I'm actually like no. Last time we were here, actually, it was so hot. It was when the heat wave was, oh. and it was extortion on the tube. How hot was it on the tube? Yeah, I actually thought melting. I was gonna. Ooh. Yeah, but I mean, you're London born and bred. Yep, we just went through yeah. East Ender. Always been in London. And, yep, but no, thanks so much for jumping on the podcast. It's literally incredible. Like one of my aspirations when I was a very young little swimmer was like, go, <laughs> do you know, like going to Olympics and yeah. meddling in Olympics, and you're a double. Me- me- double medal is that what yeah, you call yeah. it? Double medalist at the Olympics, absolutely incredible. Um, but I was reading so much about your, I guess like your first career was actually in gymnastics, mm-hmm. trampolining. Yeah, and I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. About it. And his hobby, I was like, that is literally incredible. But can you just tell us like a little bit about that and how how you even got I started got with that? Yeah. Um. So growing up as one of say one of six it was more one of three but my three closest cousins we were always together so it was always six of us in total and like our parents just had forced us into everything possible when it comes to netball swimming yeah. ballet tap jazz football um everything there was not a sport that we didn't do actually tennis I'm very upset about that but um, <laughs> every other sport we did and then we got into trampolining because I think my mom's a trampolinist or well, trampoline coach and then it's because they liked it and then after that the coach that coached us was a national coach for double mini trampolining. So he said, oh, do you guys just want to come to Gillingham Kemp for a day? And then we did. And then we never left. We just went every twice a week to keep training. And then after that, we started competing. That's incredible. And you did really, really well. I did. From what, from what I've read, <laughs> you did so incredibly yeah. well. So with so it's called double trampolining. Is that with two? Is that no, no. like... <laughs> No, it's so funny when you two, pick, two no, people. I don't it's know like what a, that means. Honestly, when people I tell people I do double mini trampoline, they're like, "Is it two? I don't get it." It's like, yeah. no, it's just like a small trumpet that you kind of ah. like. It's just like this. So you ah. bounce here and then bounce here and then you land on the mat. So it's like double as in two moves. Oh, imagine! I think I just figured it out. Yeah, just now I didn't know that. But <laughs> the whole double is like, yeah, you have two moves and then you land on the mat. And you had an injury. Mm. You, I think it was a knee niggle or injury. Yeah, but the worst if you, thing ever. Yeah, if you want to tell us a little bit about yeah. what the hell happened. So I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. It's like that bad. It was probably the worst time in my life. I just turned 17, like the week after my birthday, just started college. And like, I was really went to a girls' school, so you got boys in your school now. It's like, oh, this is exciting. It's a different world. Oh I know. <laughs> what is going on? It was so weird. I remember calling my mum. I said, mum, there's a boy in my class. What do I do? <laughs> I was so scared. Um, but then I went to the championships. So this was the senior championships because I just won the World Youth. So I thought, okay, this is going to be it because Trankerfield and um, Trampolini were battling heads. I had to choose. And I thought, okay, if I go to the championships and get a medal, I'll be happy. I'll do everything because I was I was competing really well. And I I, I won't say I, I toot my own horn, but I was really good at it. And mm-hmm. I could have got a medal or I should have got a medal. Yeah. And um, I was doing really well. But then I qualified for the final. But the day before the final, we had a team final and that they needed me to basically get all the points that we could get. And I just went out and did an amazing pass. They were called passes. Um, and as I landed, I was thinking, okay, I've really got to stick this. Imagine having this conversation in your head. Okay, I've got to stick this. What should I do? A split, la- split landing or like one leg in front, one to the, to the side? How should I do it? And I thought, okay, let me do a split landing. And as I split, my knee just went dislocated. I tore all my ligaments, oh. ACL, PCL, MCL, and fractured the bone on top of that. All so, in one go. All in one go. Once, just bang, bush, let's go. You knew straight away I just destroyed my knee. Well, as you went down, I heard the clicking in, like, you, you, internally you hear it. Yeah. And as I was thinking, mm, this doesn't feel right. And I roll onto my back and then I see my leg point in another direction with like a fat dent in the knee. I was like, mm, this ain't right. So I just started screaming and I think it was just more shock mm-hmm. that this was happening. And then my coach ran over and he just looked at me and held me and I was just like, well, I'm just screaming, screaming. And then another guy runs over. He's an American coach. And um. <laughs> It's like they I always got this, they got they had a silent conversation. He looked at me, 
then like my coach looks at me, then he looks at my co- um, the other coach, the American coach, and they looked at me and they looked back at each other, exchanged words through the eyes. He grabbed my leg and just clicked it back in person, um, back into place there and then. I was like, okay, I think that hurt more than it actually it going. Is. Yeah, a lot of people say that, don't they? Like putting something yeah. like, back in a position like your shoulders or anything mm-hmm. is... I think because like, you know it's coming. Whereas well, before I didn't know it was happening when I was going down. Yeah, yeah for sure. So that was like, okay, shock. And then when he grabbed it and then just like clicked it back in, I was like, okay, there was no warning, thanks. Um, okay, because tell me next time. But then I think because he'd done it before and it's like my coach trusted him. Like he just, they just kind of knew. And honestly, he literally got there within seconds, grabbed it and then clicked it back in and then the pain disappeared instantly. So I thank him for it. But it was just like, just a pre-warning. Yeah. So I just knew, you know. But yeah, so it dissipated everything. Was, and that, then, was that the end of the or Trampoline career. Yeah. yeah, that was it. I won't go back. <laughs> that was a no for me. <laughs> was that in terms of, was there kind of a fear that you developed from the injury in, in terms of not, because I know it happens mm. a lot of sport where people get injured from doing a sport. Yeah. And then there's this like fear block. Was it? Uh, you, 100%. Uh, I just, I just believe you're coming at such a height. And if you were to land again, mm-hmm. I just, my heart couldn't go through it again. Knowing how long it took me to get back to um, on crutches. I had two operations. So I remember the doctor telling me, oh, Asha, um, you're one I have to go home and think about. I thought, okay, Jesus Christ, Asha, you went, you really did a number. From the doctor's telling you he has to go home and think, think about, about you, it. then you know it's serious. So he said, because obviously I'm a professional athlete, he wasn't sure if he was going to give me or take, um, a, or apart from my hamstring, for my ACL for as a don- or get a donor to um, basically put it in. But then luckily he said that he had a meeting with an old guy back in the day and he said like if you have an Olympic or um, Olympic sprinter or so, whoever get a donor don't use the hamstring because obviously I'm going to end up tearing my hamstring so, again yeah. anyway so I mean we do that happens all the time with um, track and field I just call that a, t- um, a paper cut these days because they're like oh. the smallest of injuries but oh they're still God. big depending on how yeah. big the grade is but um, he said no we're going to give you a donor so then I woke up thinking okay man, is, he, is he taking it from there which he thankfully didn't and it did probably one of the best things but it was I just know one of the, um, Mark Pennell actually, he went back, he dislocated his knee and he went back and did it. But he did it like more than once. He dislocated it. I said, if I know he's doing it, I said, I'm not going to go through that again. Yeah. And I just know my heart could just, it, you couldn't take it. It was that traumatic. Um, I mean, I can get on the trampoline now and I can bounce and do all those bits and bobs, but I would never do what I did. Like I wouldn't land on a, on a mat. Mm-hmm. I would land on a trampoline or land into a pit, yeah. but I wouldn't land on a hard surface. Yeah. I just, I just don't know if I could go for that again. So when, so you were 17 mm-hmm. when all of this was happening, how long were you technically like, out of sport for? Mm. Or before, because you went back into athletics. Yeah, so I didn't do trampoline. Track, didn't you? Yeah. After what was that kind of, I guess like the time period from 17 to mm, I going think back? On paper, I believe it was like, I think I made my first senior team in 2011. I think I went to the World Indoors. I'm guessing it was that one anyway. Um, But so it was like 2007 to 2011. But it was like in and out. I was like still tearing my hamstring, tearing my calf. Like you realise, I know, you thought one was, I did the big one. And then I know it it didn't stop. It's because the knee was perfect, but everything around it stopped. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realise if you like literally sit still, for 24 hours and don't move a muscle, like, honestly, I could hold my leg in my hand and shake it. I lost, like, all muscle. When I say all muscle, it was like my leg disappeared. It was like a twig. And, like, if you put on jeans, you could feel like one side was baggy and the other side was fit. And I didn't realise that. And um, it was like, until I moved to my coach, when I moved to Steve, probably, like, 2015, 2016. It's been seven years, so when was that? Yeah, around about that time, let's just say. And um, it's only until they measured my leg I was like seven centimetres down. Really? So I was still wow. running on my leg, not realising that I had such a deficit in between you, the both. Could you, like, physically... You could see, even could if see I look it? now, you could see my calf. My calf isn't as um, big as the other. I mean, you can't tell. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at your legs, they're yeah. fucking awesome. You have to, like, you have to, like stare tell. at them, like, proper to notice the difference. It's crazy, Yeah. Man. Wow. When they, like, disappeared, like, when I say I can, like, you know, like, hold your legs like this. I could just, like, swig it around. Wobble it. Yeah. It, was, it disappeared within 24 hours. And it's because I, I didn't use it at all. And it got worse over time because when I did it, the injury, 
I must have been there for another like two or three days before we flew home because they said they can operate it here but said you could do this when you go home and it would mm-hmm. be safer to do home and obviously I could trust the doctors because if anything happened I'd have to stay out there because I did it in Canada and it was Quebec as well Oh, so really? they spoke French and I'm lying on this bed thinking like, you know, when you look up and you've got two nurses just conversating and they're just, you know, speaking Ooh, French and I'm just saying? like, and I just, I, I just think that's probably, the, I only cried like twice or I was maybe two or three times. I didn't cry when it happened because I think the shock took over. Yeah. And when they wheeled me out, um, I called, I said, I just want to talk to my mum. That's all I could say. I just remember Pete, no, I'm like, I just want to talk to my mum. I want to talk to my mum. And I spoke to her and then the tears came because they watched it live. They didn't realise um, they were watching me and they thought, Ash, I didn't know you fell over. So then mum, I just broke my leg. No, but I just saw you, we just spoke. Like, I don't understand what happened. And she had no idea that there and then I broke my leg. Once it broke it, I dislocated my knee and then like, it went like sideways. And then when they wheeled me off to the hospital, that's when I was like, this is actually real. Yeah. I'm in a foreign hospital. I'm not at home. <laughs> With a wobbly they speaking, leg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were speaking another language. What on earth is going on? And I think that's when it hit me again. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that that's terrifying for anyone, let alone your I guess your identity at the time was mm. very much with trampolining and yeah. you're probably thinking well my my leg my knee what am I supposed to do but you obviously pivoted mm. you you switched sport <laughs> and you're a double Olympic medalist in track <laughs> that is honestly crazy I just I I think I feel like I need an explanation so how have you did you always do some sort of athletics? Yeah. Like an so element of sprinting? I was, um, while I did trampolining, I just randomly got into track. And then when I won the world youths at trampolining, I then won the world juniors at track. So it was just like, I had ah. both. That's why it got to the point. So actually, gonna, I didn't even think I had needed to pick. I feel like if I didn't do, if I didn't study or anything, I think I would, I could have done both. Mm-hmm. Well, technically, I, even if I did study, I think I could have done both. I just believe I just needed to marry them better. Mm-hmm. That's all it was. I didn't understand. So I don't think I was in the gym at all at that time. It was just like pure, just, my, was it, what's, what do you call the word? Just uh, athletic ability, let's yeah. just say. Yeah. That's all I had. And I wasn't, I wasn't trained in anything. It was all fun back then. So I just did it just for the sake Enjoy of it. Then, yeah. yeah, it wasn't like, this was my job, whatever. But I think because trampolining was an Olympic sport, well, at the time, trampoline is now. But double mini isn't. So had that been Olympic sport, maybe things would have been oh, different. Oh, I see. So, but at the time, it's like, okay, actually, you would have had a junior medal and then you would have had your senior medal. Then, okay, now you can focus on athletics. Mm-hmm. But um, it was more just have fun, do both. Like my mom, my mom said seven days in a week, we was doing sports every other day. It worked out well. So I didn't see the problem until everyone else around me made it sound like it was a thing you had to choose. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to the championship, so it's fine. I'll, I'll just do my last one there and then I'll just leave. So at least I'll get a medal and it's okay. And then I dislocated myself and then didn't even get a team medal for that, actually. But then I still got high scores, if that counts. Definitely still counts. <laughs> it absolutely still counts. So obviously you are an Olympian, yeah. a double Olympian. You went in 2016 yes. to Rio. Yeah. And then you've just been to Tokyo. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, I, I can't imagine the, the difference between the games, obviously everything that happened with mm. COVID, but with the Rio games, how how was that? That's like your first it was amazing. Olympic Games. It was like surreal. You go into, well, everyone says like London was the best one. I'm like, okay, cool, but we're not in London now. We're here in Rio. Yeah. This, yeah. this is yeah. it for me. This is, has been in Ghana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. we're here now. Um, the best thing you would laugh and say is that it was probably the McDonald's that we always wore at that Olympics. It was there. And obviously everyone loves free dirty food. I'm like, going to ask you about this because Harry yeah. mentioned it as well. And I was asking about his pre <laughs> run. He's like, I had to go for Mackey's all the time. It was, yeah, it's free. It's like it tastes <laughs> even better. I don't know what it is, but it tastes, and then you get any time of day. Actually, ours wasn't 24 hours, but you'd go in there and you'd order and we had these phones that they gave us and like obviously from our apartment you could see someone in the queue so we always get a phone call oh Asha can you get me this can you get me that so then you get <laughs> so to the front line and it's like can I get five Mac, um, double Macs can I get this can I get that and it's like oh can I get one muffin it's like one muffin no uh, two three just, you know, just give me what you think like honestly if you ordered one it was like an insult so like just fill up your bags and it was like that was like the fun part of Rio but um, ours, everything was far away from us. But then it was nice because you had like a Beats house, you had the Nike house, you had all the sponsors' houses that we could go into, and it was just fun. It was, it was like imagine just being in a village, with like all your mates from different countries, all of it was it different languages, just like everyone messing around. Like, and it was like twenty four hours. It's always open. There's a games room. 
like it's like honestly, it was like so been back school, on tour. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. literally on tour as well. Just making mates on tour with everywhere, just like running different countries. It was just so much fun. So I much fun. I always wonder about that with the nutrition side because obviously obviously you said you got McDonald's, but yeah. I'm guessing there's, lo- there's <laughs> lots. What of- else do you eat? <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of different cultures. I'm guessing there's lots of people who eat different yeah. things depending on on kind of how they've been brought up culturally or what they're mm. doing for their own stuff. So. How does that kind of, is there, is there tons of places to, to eat there? And yeah. also, I think this is very relevant for me and Luke speak about a lot. The nutrition that goes into individuals and how everyone varies quite a lot from person to person. Mm-hmm. Like we are pretty lifestyle based when it comes to nutrition, mm-hmm. uh, even though we're uh, coaches and professionals within the industry. What is your What was your nutrition like around the time then kind of leading up to it and then also sort of pre-event because like I was mm-hmm. saying I was speaking to Harry and he said for him he was very much one of those people who was very flexible he could just go and get Mackies but then you yeah. had some people who were oh, definitely not me really... <laughs> definitely not <laughs> he was very rigid in, the, in yeah. their approach and, and everyone's sort of different but he said the reason why he was like that I'm sure you probably had the conversation mm-hmm. is because if he was set and he couldn't get something that he wanted to have he'd get stressed about it mm-hmm. so he, he preferred that sort of yeah. flexible approach but what what was kind of your the so they normally have like a halal section, a world food section, uh, an Asian section. So you just basically tour the whole um, canteen and figure out what you like. And I'll just go back to that place over and over again because it is stressful. It's so big. Like when you've got so much people in there, there's like thousands of people and like everyone's just trying to get food. It's just, it's just, it's just so much. It's overwhelming. Like you just go to what you know and just go there and just be mm. happy with it. When it comes, yeah, so you're going in the canteen, it's just very busy. I just get overwhelmed. So I would find a section I would really like and just eat there. So it's, there was, well, for Tokyo, the Asian section was fine. But to be honest, I think they only knew how to cook their own food. Everything yeah. else was just a mess. Yeah. And I would literally just eat there the whole time and just not eat anything else. And plus, I don't eat red meat anymore. Mm-hmm. And that was only a choice because when we go to these type of events, we'll say events, competitions, get all you can eat breakfast, or you can eat lunch, or you can eat dinner and meat. I will just eat. And it's like, you're sitting there, like, so we're sitting here at a table and we're having a great conversation and then it's like, I'm just going to get something else. I'm just going to get something else. And all now I've just had eaten so much and I'm not the only one putting on weight for some reason and everyone else will lose weight because I'm always eating carbs. I love rice and I'll just eat that and pasta. Like, no one else can take me to it. And I'll just pile it on, pile it on, put pile it on because I feel like I can only trust it. You can't go wrong with just yeah, yeah. boiling these things. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I'll just eat that with gravy or something small on the side. But um, you, I just... Me, I'm not so, not say fussy when it comes to eating, but when it comes to race time anyway, I like, you kind of stop. I don't think it's a nervous energy, but I won't eat as much. I'll just like, just pick at things. And even after I compete, I wouldn't even feel as hungry. So like for the whole, like, say 10 days, I wouldn't eat as much, which is really weird when I think about it. But um, yeah, I'm not so much to like calorie, calorie kind of person Mm -hmm. or macros, cutting your macros, just because I'm not say a rebel, but. I like to eat yeah. so I just can't have someone tell me actually you can't eat because then I'm gonna go eat it but I do think twice I won't eat like fried food as such okay as much or like I wouldn't go for like burgers or I would still eat clean mm-hmm. but just make sure I pick the right things or eat what I could out of the right options that we have because in Tokyo they love pork really like pork. Yeah. Yeah. and lots of those yeah majority yeah. of all their meals they just had pork in it it was really and annoying I like actually that's not a massive British thing. We're no. more we're more chicken. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We have a lot of chicken here, but that's so interesting mm. to hear you talk about nutrition because I think a lot of people listening would think it must be so regimented. Yeah. Yes, everything must be tracked. Broccoli, rice, chicken. I mean, I probably should. <laughs> and I, and I, no, but it works but I'm just for not. you. <laughs> yeah. and, but Harry was so similar, yeah. wasn't he? He was like, it's not... It's not well, Harry's, like Harry's he wakes up with abs. Like, yeah. he does, he, Harry must be the only person literally. who has like free coffees a day with full yeah. milk and free sugars in his exactly. coffee. Exactly. Like... And you wouldn't even see like an ounce on him. Nah. Like whether I'm working hard. I only lose weight this time of year, you know. I would start, like we start training in October and I would be, when I tell you I'll be good. For even if, you t- if I did it good for like four weeks, ate well, I tell you I wouldn't even shift in nothing. But then only when I start racing, it's like, I don't know what it is, but I just trim off that way. And then like now I'm at my lightest, at my prime position, um, prime. So it's like, yes, perfect for holiday pictures, you know, great. But um, <laughs> that's the only time would, I would actually lose the weight. But other than that, I would just stay thick throughout the whole season until the, um, su- the summer season. So with your training, are you not like training at the moment? Oh, I had my last race yesterday. 
Are so, you yeah. in Switzerland? Well, you were in Switzerland yeah. at some point. Yeah, like last week. And last now I'm week. here. Yeah, so I was in Switzerland last weekend and then had a race on Monday and now I'm done. And now you're here? Yeah. So what does your train look like when you kind of come off the back of, say, your last yeah, race? Then? Is that kind of just curious. sort of deload, wind that, wind yeah, down? Yeah, I would, I would at least take two weeks off, like, to do nothing. And then the rest will just be, right, just stay fit because I just know, like, I'm trying to not get back to where I was last night because I came back a bit too heavy. <laughs> But I want to just come back and be like semi-fit because next year is really big again. As much as we just had Olympics, we've mm. got a world indoors, a world outdoors, a Commonwealth, which is going to be home in Birmingham, and then a European Championships. And they're all like six weeks. We've got three major championships. Don't know how it's going to work. Wow, I feel like but, that's um, really, really close together. Yeah. Is, that, is it not usually? No, it's always um, we have a a world, maybe a Commonwealth and a Europeans in the same year, but not a world's. They've, so it's, they've done triple yeah, threat because everyone no, it's just because of COVID they've all pushed it, pushed back. it back so it's literally six weeks and I've never had we've never had like a major championship and a week later we've got Commonwealth and then like a week later after that you've got Europeans and it's like okay what championships do you pick because Worlds is obviously the biggest one you wanted to go to Worlds plus in Oregon it's going to be a, a quick track it's going to be amazing then you have a home Commonwealth you know, like, we can't miss a home games Yeah. and then it's the Europeans at the end so it's like which ones are you going to do are you going to be able to do all of them because I'll probably, if I did the 100, it'd be the 100 and the relay. So it's the beginning and the end of the championships. So it's like, okay, where's the break? Um, wow. Yeah, so I just, that will be a conversation I'll have with my coach in October when I come back. It's like, yeah, I can't do that now. Let me just, I've had a good fun this year. Let me debrief, let yeah. me relax and then we'll get back on the horse and then we can discuss it. But I don't know how it's going to work next year. I really wow. don't. That is, <laughs> yeah. Well, glad it's you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> how hard is it to prepare for this previous one with everything else that was going on with COVID because I'm sure that was yeah. very, very different in, in all sorts of different elements that kind of would have been impacted as well as like social, mental health mm -hmm. and also kind of trying to practice and guessing in a very peculiar way. Mm -hmm. It was weird. When the first lockdown hit, I was actually in America at the time. So I was on a training camp and I found it quite funny because we were just booking to go. So my whole group was going to Texas and then we had two, or well, about three French athletes that were coming over with us and then they were saying, oh, it's all kicking off. They can't come. I said, what do you want about? Like, you coming on? we just thought they were just being long about it. It's like, we're trying yeah. to book. Are you with us or you're not? To only find out when I flown out, because we were still allowed to travel to America. It was, I think I got there the Friday and then Trump turned around and said, okay, Europe, I mean, the whole of Europe can't basically come here on the Monday. I was like, oh, so this is real. Okay, um, so now I'm stuck here. I think I was there for about 10 days until it got worse and worse. And then everyone was saying, oh, actually, you should come home. But I was like, whatever stress you're going through in the UK was not happening in America <laughs> because where I was was so quiet. It was a, a college station is a small town. It's like Loughborough, mm -hmm. but just bigger. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was quiet. Like, I didn't, there wasn't any problem until I, certain things started to close and stuff. I said, okay, cool. Let's come back now because Boris made a big scene about it. And then I was like, okay, if you're abroad, get home. It's okay, we travelled home. And then, um, yeah, we was basically on grass trying to find tracks and getting kicked off a track by the police because they say no you can't train on these tracks even though it's all outdoors like it was it was stressful my training partner was working in the evening so I would get up in the morning during a pandemic can you imagine <laughs> he had me leave my bed at like nine o'clock in the morning but anyway you had, you had, you had your, your sleeping pattern was so off so I went to bed late got up to go training um, to leave my house which was like a 40 minute drive to a track to only get kicked off honestly I could have killed him in those moments <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that was so frustrating but um, yeah that's what basically we did we tried to break into other tracks that we probably shouldn't be breaking into but if we was social distancing and trying to be good like there wasn't a, much of a problem so that was very stressful until they figured out we could in the end train at the Lee, Lee Valley where we train now and it wasn't so bad but then it was just when it got to the next year, so I didn't race that year in 2019 just because I, I couldn't see my physios. Mm -hmm. It was just too much of a mess for me. My body needs Were you still treatment. with your coach? Was he still like coaching you during oh, yeah, no, co no coaching? Not at all. We tried to get my SNC coach to come at the time and then wherever bridge he got over, he got pulled over by the police. And yeah, he couldn't lie correctly. He wasn't lie correctly. He just couldn't tell the truth in a good way. So yeah. he had to go home. <laughs> So yeah, we was doing everything by ourselves. That's going by weights and just try and use them in car parks and stuff like that. It was that bad, that bad. Did some people struggle more than others? Would you say that time regards like the preparation yeah. for it? Because I mean, I, I definitely did. did you? My training partners, they were able to race by the end of the year, but me, it just didn't work out at all. Like I know my body needs therapy just because of like, yeah, I did my knee in 07. People still forget like just the, 
the things I had to break away from all those years because I got a lot, I picked up a lot of subconscious things that I didn't realise I was doing. So yeah. if I didn't, if my body wasn't right, I'd use the other side and the left side would shut down. And like, it was just, yeah, it just wasn't working for, well for me. So then luckily when everything started to open up, we obviously this year it worked, but then the travelling was stressful. Yeah. Like I've never thought travelling to be like so draining. Mm. Like you just, I just yeah. didn't want to do it anymore. It got to a point, I think I did like two, maybe three races abroad. And even then it was just like, could you get into meets? Could you get this? Could you get that? And then I wasn't running as fast, maybe because obviously the year before I didn't have the best season. Well, I didn't have a season. So I think it impacted me on this season. And it, yeah, it just wasn't the greatest for me. But then somehow I put it, managed to put it together for the trials to qualify. But pre, like prior to that was just a shambles. Like it really was just stress. I could only imagine because obviously for a lot of other people in the UK and around the world, it mm -hmm. was mentally draining. Like yeah. we, we spoke about a couple of times, we started seeing an even therapist during the lockdown from never having issues with mental health before. Yeah. So I can only imagine like when that's your bread and butter. Yes. The one thing that you can't do. Yeah. Not not just a physical impact, but how much that psychological impact can have on an athlete as well. Uh, honestly, I think it was, I, I think I survived because of my family. We all quarantined together. So my sister came home, my brother came home and then obviously the kids were all there. That yeah. was, that was eventful. Um, but, it was nice that we had that. So I would like leave for a couple of hours to go training on a grass pitch somewhere, then come back, then I'll go for a cycle with the kids or just do something to get them outside because I know they were driving them a lot in, um, indoors insane. And um, obviously because I've got two nieces, the other one is a terror. <laughs> and uh, she's, <laughs> she needed like, honestly, when I came home, it was like, oh, Asha, take her. Like, honestly, it was like, <laughs> yeah, they needed a break. So I was like, the, the, I'm always the fun aunt. So we had to learn how to entertain the kids. I would get cakes to bake them and stuff like that like cupcakes we just even though her, her what is it her mom bakes cakes for a living i'm getting them ones out of a box <laughs> and teach them how to make it <laughs> um so that was fun but honestly it, i think that's the only reason why i think i survived other than that i don't know because we have a garden as well so i don't know how other people would have survived knowing that they didn't have gardens they were just in at home by themselves some people that haven't seen their family for like a year or two i thought that would have driven me insane. Like yeah. I would have packed my stuff and gone to my family's because I don't know how I, any other way I would have done that. My cousin is by herself and so does my auntie. So they moved in together for that part. Plus her house was getting redone so she had no walls so she had no chance oh. to leave. But at least we weren't by ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we made sure we could cope that way because the, my whole family are teachers and then obviously they're not teaching kids. Everything was all online or that was all yeah. messy. But yeah. Honestly, if we didn't have each other, I don't think I would have survived because I, I did see people struggle. And I know that it got to a point where people don't want to go outside anymore. It's like they are very much, oh no, I'll just stay in. Or they're very scared to go outside. If it, The people say, if you haven't been vaccinated or this, any other. Or like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And then like, they literally just shrivel up. Like I didn't see, um, so when my grandma was alive, she only died like January the 1st, let's just say. Mm. And um, like, I didn't see them for such a long period. But I think, because I went up to Loughborough to go training because that was open. I think I just turned up at their front door and then she's like, oh, so surprised to see that because obviously they wouldn't, they wouldn't even let me in the house. Like, my, like no one's been in that house yeah. really. But um, she did let me in anyway and like pick me in my head in to see my grandma and stuff. But because obviously I'm out here training and traveling. She, yeah. we, not so we're shielding her, but she's 103. Like she was getting old. So we didn't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the reason yeah. <laughs> for anything to happen. Yeah, I know. Oh, and she didn't die from COVID either. So I think I've got good genes. Yeah. You've got so, yeah. great genes. <laughs> So yeah, I, I can only imagine like it, it'd be really difficult for depending on what sport you're in as mm -hmm. well. Because I, I saw some some stuff on like Instagram and TikTok and stuff, and there's like people swimming in fucking mini pools at well, home. Yeah, with, with the yeah, yeah. And if your event requires a lot of different operations yeah. or whatever, that, that can be really like difficult well, to, to do anything for. Yeah, mm -hmm. British swimming got delivered. The, um, the little whirlpool thing, so the resistance pool. So all the ITC <laughs> people got those pools. Yeah. And then, yeah, so did Loughborough, I know Bath opened for mm -hmm. the swimmers. So was Loughborough track open first in terms of like everybody who needs to train come and train? If he was unfunded, if he was a funded ah. athlete or in the end, I think if he was an England athlete, there was like certain rules and regulations or if he was on the long list to go to Olympics, you could train indoors. So it was like, imagine this whole facility and it was like less than 10 of us in there. It was that quiet. I mean, it was nice, but it was really quiet. Wow. Like you just thought like, okay, you felt lucky and privileged to be yeah. indoors. Because mm. bearing in mind, this is like October, November and it's cold. Freezing. 
And I just felt, honestly, we see the videos of my training partners outside in the corner. I said, I don't know how you do this. That's how they call me a princess sometimes because I'd be like, Mm-mm, I'm not going out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. No, because my coach will say if it's like minus, I think below three, we're not like, we don't go outside and do a running session. It's like three, that's still cold, Steve. But um, we wouldn't do, we would do a session indoors because you wouldn't get what you wanted out of the session depending on how fast it is outdoors if it's cold. So um, we just do our sessions indoor, but obviously it's winter so we can do that stuff. But I just felt so sorry for the rest of the guys. Yeah. You could, and they would with um, just standard pedestrian, like normal pedestrians, and like obviously we had, there's like a track etiquette in a way. You would say if you shout track, that means get like move out the way someone's coming yeah. or stuff like that. You just there's certain rules, but you would just if someone's running, you step out and just be weary of your surroundings. Yeah. And you got people there prams, their bikes, oh, no. and you just got kids running left, right, and center. Especially when it started to get hot, everyone was coming out for nice walks, but they just didn't understand move. And yeah. like you'd get, so my training partner actually got injured running into someone. Really? Like, yeah, because, um, so you're just running around the track, you meant to stay in the lane, but no, someone was just like running around the side, just going across. And you could just see, there was a collision between actually a, a guy and an older lady. And it was just really bad, like span, tub all overs, and everything. And they could really get hurt from that. If someone's coming at you. Well, I mean, you run well. so fast. Exactly. And imagine running into someone. Yeah. So yeah, that was it was rough. It was brutal to see. Imagine they actually got on camera as well. To be fair, that really? they actually <laughs> saw that. So it, it's it wasn't the best of things, but um, I think I was just lucky to be indoors because obviously I was a fun and athlete yeah. and on the long list as well. So with you've you've obviously so you've gone to train inside and you've well from what you've said you've turned things around and you've qualified mm-hmm. from the trials and you've. You've gone to Tokyo with like one of the hardest years, like absolutely yeah. with COVID and everything like that. So with Tokyo, and I only saw a few bits and bobs, like everything you were putting mm-hmm. up, it was just so funny. <laughs> it was literally so hilarious. And I was watching loads of people at the Olympics, their stories and things. What was it What was it like with like masks and COVID tests? Oh, and yeah. Jail. Like, was it a bit of like a dead atmosphere? Like jail. What? Really? It was jail. J- jail. I've never been to jail before, but it felt like prison. In comparison to being usually like so social. Yeah, like, like yeah. as being in Rio, we could jump in a taxi anywhere. We could do, it was left to our own devices. We're all adults, so as long as you're there to compete and do what you do, need to do, you can do what you like afterwards or before whatever your routine is. Whereas Tokyo, um, to even to get in there, we had to do tests as soon as we got off the plane. We took we took a test 14 days before we left. Then we had to do like. Um, lateral flow test then 96 hours we had to do a PCR test 72 hours we had to do a PCR test when we landed we had to do a spit test that was really weird like, just, <laughs> honestly they were just nasty when you think about it is that just spitting, spit, spitting yeah, in like a... spitting into a tube as soon as we landed <laughs> exactly <laughs> we had to wait for that and then we could leave we was on the app we had to on this app we have um, every day we had to talk about if you had any symptoms your temperature checks and then you had to do a PCR every morning. So you had to fill it out every day, literally. And it was quite funny, though, because they said the testing was between 7 and 10 a.m. And you see Tracker Field come down at like 9.49. Like 9.59, <laughs> so that would be me at the end. It's like, so why was it for you guys? Well, if you gave us an earlier time, yeah. we would have come. But you told us to finish at 10, <laughs> so we'll be there just before 10. And then um, you see all the other sports like done there. It's all professional and stuff. Like, no, Tracker Field is so, like, relaxed. But um, you would you had to take a, it's like a lollipop. We wasn't a local tag, just the normal ones you kind of pop your nose, yeah, but you yeah. put it on your tongue and you had to walk for 30 seconds and then put it in a tube, a test tube. So it was done every morning. You can eat or brush your teeth for 30 minutes prior to doing it. Um, and then where we had dinner, there was a small, say, outdoor space. It was like, say, 30 metres with a few bikes. That was our balcony that we had. Uh, if you wanted to go for a walk, it was between 7, I think, till 10 a.m. There was an outdoor space that was about 40, maybe 50 metres. You could go for a walk and that was supervised. And that was only only in the mornings you could go on those walks. Uh, what else did we have? Oh, we could only go from, the, yeah, for us, actual buses. We weren't allowed to mix buses. So from our bus, track and field bus, to go to the athletics track and then back. And rugby and football were also there. But um, they had their own buses. We still want to, like, honestly, even go to the same place. Or if they want to leave late, later, they couldn't do it. Had actual, your own organised bus. And then um, when it came out, because we was in a hotel, and the hotel would go, we would only stop at the first floor. We couldn't, or the second floor, we couldn't go to the first or the ground floor. We had our separate stairs that we had to walk into. We weren't allowed to mix with the public. Um, from the section from outdoor, from the doors to the bus, it would come like a zebra crossing. They would stop everyone and they would walk onto the bus and then same vice versa. If they was walking past, we wouldn't have to go. We had to wait. It was very much like police with everything that we did. And oh, so some of the 
distance runners had, like there was a golf course they were allowed to go onto and run and they got a car there and the cars were tracked. So they noticed if you would stop to go on the, the wrong way, you would get into trouble for it. Like you had to kind of like prove that you would literally just got lost or you was trying to find your own way. And when it comes to filling up the tank with petrol, you had to call someone to come and do it. And then someone would come and fill your tank and then leave like you wasn't allowed to leave the car. You was like literally in lockdown. You was only allowed to go to the venue and back. No mixing. Literally, that was what we did. And then Prison. when people yeah. finished their event, so you just <laughs> flown home then? Oh yeah, so after the event, um, 48 hours max. If you competed in the morning, you would have left the following day. Unless you competed in the afternoon, then you'd leave like literally 48 hours max. Literally. You were, you didn't. We barely mixed with half the other sports, by the way, because some of the sports had a different venue that they trained in and they stayed like at a university. We had a few rowers. I think they were there before we left or cycling. Um, the boxers were there, weightlifting, the gymnasts. So there's a few of us that were there. Yeah. But track and field, like, we're there for like 10 days in a holding camp, whereas some of them would just fly in for two or three days and then go straight into the village. So it was like a point where it was quite busy with um, a number of athletes. But then obviously it started to trickle off as time went on. Obviously, because track and field is like one of the biggest, yeah. I think. Yeah. We were like 76 or 75 athletes. And that's not obviously including staff. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of us to handle. But honestly, we had a little small, um, there was only like a few tables and chairs that we could mingle with. And even then, you always had to have your mask on 24-7. We had screens, sorry. That was really? a shocker. Like, so say if we're sitting down at dinner, there'll be a, sc- oh, God, sorry. There'll be a screen in front of us and like you try to hear something like, oh, wait, what did you say? And like, try, and obviously you get a mask and like, put it down, we can't on. hear nothing. It was like proper. You had to wipe down everything that you used. Wasn't that touch. When we got our food served, we never um, served ourselves. Uh, the colleagues would do it. Also, the, the hotel staff would do it and there was a screen for them as well. Like, we did not mix at all with any of the public. Like, there was always, always British people. And obviously the... Opening ceremony. You, oh, yeah, we don't You weren't to allowed that. to go. No, we're, but we no never one. go, though. Do you not? No, track and field doesn't. We're like the, the end of the first week, beginning of the second. Mm. So it's very much oh. like we're not in the holding camp. I mean, so we're still in the holding camp. We're not in the village. You're not there yet. So that's the only reason why we don't go. And usually, like in Rio, they put on a, we went to a hotel and they put on this little parade for us. We paraded around the pool. We all got dressed up in the kit. And it was nice. They had a cinema room and we watched the team come out. But this year was just like, yeah. Nothing. Nothing. They don't always nice. Nothing. Is that quite hard? I mean, you did so well at these games. We'll go into that in a sec. But was it was it hard to kind of get yourself up for it? It was because it was like, are we? What are we here for? Like, it felt yeah. like it was just a normal. Comp- like, so now I went to Switzerland. It felt like one of those meets. Like, I just went to Switzerland for a weekend, well, for two days, and then competed and then left. It. That's exactly how it felt. Had I not done the relay. It would, have been, it would have been more because it was, obviously I got to stay there for the rest of the week and basically we left the day before the final day. But it was very much, mm, what, what is this? Like you didn't, you didn't realise it was the Olympics until you kind of mixed with other teams when it was at the holding camp and then when you go to the village then you realise, okay, it's an Olympics. But you, the, the feeling just wasn't there. It was, it was, I mean, they tried, but they didn't. Yeah. yeah so it was a bit sad. And it, it kind of, it kind of came across that way watching it on TV, didn't it, as well? Like, we loved, I loved watching it this year mm-hmm. because I did feel it's what the country needs, it's what everyone needed, yeah. the morale and, mm-hmm. like, watching sport and things like that. But it was when you're looking at the stadium and mm-hmm. Empty. and no one's in it. So was there no, no like, was there fake claps? Did they no, put on fake? I didn't even know. No, because we even had... Um, football, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> they like should have done that. Cheering. I don't think they had that. I don't, we had the commentators... Um, Catherine Mary was on it and um, I felt like she was only speaking to us like yeah. she was just telling yeah. us who's uh, who, this one's next to you Asha that one's on the <laughs> other side Honestly, that's literally how it felt it didn't wow. feel like it was a, a thing but we didn't you don't notice it when we we're on the track so when we're running it's like a blur for us so yeah we, if I'm hearing crowds that's when you know I'm not running fast enough if you hear silence then that's great but um, yeah it wasn't we didn't notice it. Okay, as an athlete, you wouldn't feel it. But when you're sitting down watching it, yeah. you'll be like, what on earth Going is this? On. But then for the sprints, the the final, they had put on a really good light show and it was amazing. But they didn't do it for any other event. So that didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it just, it, it, I don't know. Because then again, I just went to Switzerland, as I just said, but there was a crowd and it was just insane. 
like, I thought, wow, it's so, it feels to have people around us again. Yeah. But then when you go to the Olympics, it was, I think it would have given an extra more boost. As much as we don't notice the crowd, we would have felt them. And it, when you know, like, my whole family would have been there, it would have been, like, a great feel. But we come into a job and it's like, you're just so focused that you don't even notice it. So it has pros and cons for us, but we just feel, like you said, for the whole morale, for everyone to just get that big boost of something. But plus, they would say there was in a state of emergency. I wouldn't say that was a lie, but obviously each country has a different type mm-hmm. of state of emergency. But they, it wasn't that bad because where our, our holding camp was, was only, say, about 40 minutes um, away from the village itself. They had a stadium for baseball and they had a crowd. Really? So we were really confused. Yeah, so it's like, no, these people could be here. It's not like we're, we're mixing with them. There was yeah. a block. But yes, yeah, so that was a shame. So do you feel like, for you, that the crowds don't affect your performance? Uh, if it was a home crowd, yes. A home crowd is like the UK. There's only like Switzerland, the UK and Germany know how to support, like scream, shout. Like it's it's a nice feeling. Um, so I feel like if it was a UK meet, then I, you would have noticed a difference. Mm-hmm. But... I think just because you you just knew what to expect, you prepared yourself. There's going to be no crowd. It's going to be silent. And throughout the year, we've had quiet meets anyway. So it wasn't brand new to me. So for my first indoor meet in Germany, like that's why I I noticed it was weird. Like on the start line, I I felt it was fine. The gun goes, you're so focused. But as soon as I was walking out the venue to turn around and look, okay, oh, what's on now before I leave? I felt like I was watching a kid, like, I don't even kids me. It's just felt like yeah. it was that bad. It's just like, it was just everyone just running around and said, it was a distance. What, I don't even know what event, probably like 3K. They were running around thinking, what is this? Like, I was like, yeah. this cannot be real. Like, that, that's when I noticed, oh, there isn't a crowd. It felt, you could hear them mm-hmm. running Sweet. on the track. Yeah. And I thought, that's when you know it's serious. It's a bit boring. I, I wouldn't even want to watch my own me. I, w- I would rather watch on TV. It gives you more of like, okay, this is a, yeah, real. a real thing. Yeah. So there's a few other things that were different with this. L- Olympics, I think, as well, wasn't it? They did some of the like mixed relay teams in oh, other yeah, sports that's and stuff. As well. the first it was quite time. interesting to watch because I think I watched the there was like a triathlon one at the very, very start where they did a mixed as well. Oh, did they? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they did, I like, a mixed that. that was on and off the bike. That was quite cool. To, I mean, that was a longer event because it was like two oh. hours, but even that was quite cool to see because you get the different dynamics of where the females yeah. and males are up to and kind of strategically where people are yeah. being placed with other parts as well. So that was quite a cool thing to see. And I guess, again, when we're looking at genders within mm-hmm. sport, I was quite cool to see the kind of mixture and so how, how did you see all this stuff because we had terrible footage let's just say we didn't know what we was watching after things that we couldn't see anything and even when it came to our TVs we'll flick through the channels of what's on it was all in silence like it was like you'd only hear like what was happening at the track or it's like if you watched another video you could just only hear the water like you could only hear there there was like no commentators not even in Japanese it was nothing really? really? yeah it was bad I, I feel it was quite good this year which is why I think a lot of people enjoyed it because ev- it was on Channel 1 wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Olympic highlights every day all day oh. so they were picking different sports okay. every hour every half hour they were switching they were going back to the hub mm. was it where they were all talking about the sports they'd mm. I was why so I loved that. <laughs> I thought that was actually really good. Though. I had no idea you. Yeah, we were struggling. You guys couldn't. We were struggling. Which I bet it's a bit shit, isn't it? I because mean, they did can't... give us a, like an, um, a login to watch SkyGo and stuff, but even then, it wasn't like if I wanted to watch something like my friends competing, yeah. like we couldn't watch them. We had to go for different avenues or channels. It was just it was a lot. It really was a lot. Yeah. So with with that whole um, mixture of genders and stuff within the, the different categories, mm-hmm. there's obviously a big one in, in weightlifting as well with. Oh, yeah. Laura Hubbard and there's a lot of controversy around that because they thought there's gonna so we we spoke up quite a few different times didn't we and we had uh, another transgender athlete on called Alex mm-hmm. from, from Gymshark as well who we spoke to okay, was talking yeah. about doing different roles and there's there's obviously a lot of positives and negatives in, in the media and I think there's mm-hmm. been a lot of changes or looking at a lot of changes even after that as well mm-hmm. Um, so it's, I suppose it's difficult it's a, it's a bit of a strange grey area yeah. time at the moment isn't it for sport to see kind of what's going to happen moving forward because you get a lot of, well we have a lot of say hermaphrodites in track and obviously they were born well with both is that like intersexual is it where you have the the male and female genitalia? yeah yeah so it's hard to tell someone oh you must find for you must be a boy you must be a girl but then you're too fast to be a girl you're too slow to be a boy it's difficult i don't know how the world is going to move with it like obviously because this is this is people this is people's bodies and obviously people that are um transgender and stuff i don't know how they would go about it but 
I feel like it's only been thrown negative. It was only been negative into sports because it's just new mm-hmm. and no one expects it. Because obviously, was it that the way that the New Zealand? Wait, that's what you're talking about. Yes, Laurel. Laurel yeah, Laurel. Laurel. Yeah. Because yeah. obviously, people say that you've been a man for so long. Then how can and you was a weightlifter then? How can you possibly be a female? Like, so I see both sides. It's just. <sighs> I don't know. Everyone's saying, do they need a separate Olympics? Do they need their own ch- championships well, and stuff? Yeah. yeah. But um, I wouldn't know. Yeah. it's. I Because I, I see it in the track how there's these two young girls and how Casa Semenya was treated. Yes. And I feel like they're still human beings at the end of the day. Like, that's still someone's child. I always make people know that is somebody's child you're just talking about. Like, be nice. And um, I just don't think they handled her situation well. Not at all. Um, so... I, I, there has to be an avenue because it's there's more people that are finding out their sexual um well their sexuality and then again I think it's a lot of African countries that don't know it's like you only know until you start competing and then mm-hmm. when you get tested oh you have both but at the time they didn't know that so it's like you can't blame someone for not knowing for their whole entire life or if they've been brought up as a female how are you going to now tell them oh no it's, you can't run as female you must take these mm-hmm. hormones it's quite rough mm-hmm. and um I just hope that they come with some sort of solution so everyone is on the same playing field and it's accepted because to trash someone like that, like just because you were born a certain type of way, is just like, it's harsh. I think that's a difficult thing, isn't it? Because like people are talking about things past you, then it's mm-hmm. not, for example, we spoke up before, it's not Laura Hubbard's fault. She's just following her passion and yeah. what she wants mm-hmm. to do. But obviously it's the kind of impact it has on, on female sport and it's not that individual. It's, mm-hmm. it's the kind of status of what it, stands for which like we yeah. said is it's difficult and I think it's the same with Zacassa as well who yeah. I think she sort of tried to appeal it didn't she or something she did yeah she fought I, she went through a lot yeah like they had on hormones and stuff oh like I, I, it's just it's not nice yeah. but I understand like there's both sides like you have got just people that were just born and raised were well, born a female born a male and it's like okay well we can't do what you do you're obviously going to be stronger than us but I get it but it's I don't know how they could. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. You, you'll see that as well. Like, the, I'm, I'm guessing you'll sometimes run with the guys and stuff as well. Mm-hmm. They, they, they pulled some research up in regards to women's times, and then there was 16, 17 year old boys in college in America running the same time as the female times, and they were, that's what they're trying to compare. Mm-hmm. Saying it just isn't the same thing. And it can, yeah. It's just going to spoil female sport if that if that mm-hmm. eventually happens, and it seeps into all avenues of of the Olympics and that's why potentially we spoke about the same thing about having that separate group for yeah. the part of to create that equality and I mean it's difficult isn't it There's no, I don't think you could absolutely say this is the answer to mm-hmm. this is what's going on and we're in this world and society where things are changing so quickly and we've never dealt with this kind of thing before it's, in sport yeah. or in any other avenue mm-hmm. so it's it's difficult to kind of say this is the avenue it needs to go down I just feel like our um like everyone's sexuality is moving faster than how sport is moving. Mm-hmm. So it's like they just need to level up and try and move together so everyone's accepted and everyone gets a chance. Because I don't feel like, oh, just because you've changed, you can't compete. I just feel like it's just going to be a bit difficult for you to compete in a new gender just because you've been something else um, for a number of previous years. Mm-hmm. So say if you was a male for 30 years and then now you want to compete for a women's sport. I don't feel like I have a problem with it. I just feel like you just need to give them time to create an avenue yeah. for your sexuality mm-hmm. it's also really hard as well because with Laurel she didn't end up competing she didn't get her lifts she yeah. missed her lifts year. I think the, the thing is what and what I speak about we got with Chris yesterday on the podcast that we did that I think Laurel is like the third oldest Olympian to compete in that category and she had a major injury two years before mm. so if you had someone who was fresh 25 yeah. years old come into that category who'd been a male for a long period of time, it's going to be a different story to when mm-hmm. Laurel did it and there probably would have been a, a greater impact on the news afterwards of what would have came out of her. I also mm. think though, for her, her mental health. Oh yeah. She, she yeah, was, was horrible. She was like a scapegoat. Mm-hmm. For, yeah. And I, you, you, don't, you can't put yourself in that position mm-hmm. and how hard that must have been to be on. And like you said, it, it was pretty negative. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of positive that I was think it was great for the trans those. community from from just speaking to other people and stuff and the news that was coming out of it I don't think I think there's far more negatives that came of it although the what they were trying to do was probably a positive thing for mm-hmm. for transgender in sport but I just feel like it wasn't potentially done in the right way there's always going to be a first and a first never yeah, gets to the world so it's just it's at least she's opened the doors yeah. and people are going to start talking about it and then hopefully in the next four years 
there'll be something better or for the next generation to come in because she's not going to be the only person. There's going to be other several yeah, yeah. transgender oh, sure. children coming through and then it's like, okay, this person did it so that means I can do it. So it's just, like I said, the sexuality and sport just needs to move in sync. Right about now, yeah. it's just, they're just not matching up. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I have a question. I was going to mm-hmm. ask this before, but then we we changed topics a bit. <laughs> With your racing, do you have some sort of pre-race ritual? Didn't you say Harry had a weird thing he does? Harry, when I went to Harry, just so they have a Mackey's and I jump up and down really high. Like, yeah, he does. Oh, yeah, he does that <laughs> thing where he like yeah, shoots yeah, yeah, up yeah, in the yeah. air. But do you have, or when, or when you're running or a pre-post, is there like a little something? Uh, I feel like there is. I thought, well, most, the night before, I make sure my stuff's all packed so I don't stress in the morning. Everything's laid out, iron, all good to go. And then when I get dressed, I always put my left shoe on first for some reason now. I don't know why. Ooh, but now but it's you, like I always do yeah, it. Yeah, you can't not now. And I'm a, right, I'm a righty all the time, so I always go right and everything else. But when it comes to my spikes, I put my left one on first. I think even when I go to the gym now, I put my, my left, left shoe first. Left shoe on. I don't know why I do it. But that's the thing for me now. The ritual. Superstitious. Mm. Yes, yeah, if anyone wants to be an Olympic sprinter, put your left, <laughs> your left shoe on first. Wouldn't it, work for me. Yeah. Left shoe. <laughs> Harry was messing me before this as well and he was saying one of the things to bring up is that you have a terrible taste in, mu- in music. I so- do not. Is it called something called soccer? Soccer. soccer. I don't believe Sorry. it's a terrible choice of music. <laughs> I just believe that Harry and I have been brought up differently. <laughs> well, I've heard Harry's taste in music and it's, it's not great anyway. Yeah, so. I, I do like his South African house. That's not bad that he <laughs> plays. That's a bit of his Afro beats. Mm. But Harry's like got a wide range of stuff. But I do like soccer because I'm a Caribbean girl and I like love the Caribbean. Obviously, it's kind of a weekend as it would have been bank holiday. So I had a great weekend. Even though I did race, I still had a wonderful um, outing with my family. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's very Caribbean, let's just say that. It's just very upbeat and great. Energy. A energy. lot of energy. Big energy. And, yeah. And... I am assuming, and I know I saw it anyway, but the energy that you had with your three other girls when you were doing that relay. Mm -hmm. If you're comparing like a single event to a relay, is there one that you prefer? Or like even at Tokyo's Games, how would you say, because I know you did an Instagram post about your uh, semi-final and things Mm -hmm. like that, and you were a little bit disappointed with with your race how how was it this year I guess with the actual races that you went and did and obviously you meddled in the four by one um to even make the the Olympics was not say a surprise but I definitely had struggled so I wasn't running fast throughout the whole year so mm. the times that I did in the Olympics I mean I just I knew I should have done better by then but I just hadn't for some reason I know someone uh, one of the athletes even asked us because they said how do you run your individual and then have to pick yourself back up to go and run a relay a couple of days later Bearing in mind, you've gone through so much emotions, highs, lows, the energy, the the, the stress, because it's it's not easy going through two rounds. Uh, we're just like the fastest girls in the world, let's just say. And like this is your, you build your moment up. This comes up every four years or three years for the next one. Everyone keeps telling me. But it was like such a massive build up and it was so exhausting. And then I don't know how you pick yourself up to go, okay, God, I've got to do this again. you got to do the whole warm up. Like the season isn't finished. You just have to keep going. But it's just all a mental thing. If you tell yourself you can do it, you can. And I feel like that makes, now I've finished racing, like had I just stayed stronger, I said, okay, I can go until September because normally I'll go for mid-September. But I said, no, I've not had the best year. Let me just cut it now. But, um, you know, it's the relay is a bit of fun. And it's like, so it's less stress because a final was still a final at the end of the day. Yeah. And no one, like you want to be there, but you don't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so the heat was perfectly fine. I was um, talking to the girl who, I, Amani, I passed the baton to her. And I was making jokes with one of the Dutch girls. So we was all having like great banter. Like it was all smiley, giggly. And then the final comes and you're like, oh, okay, silence. I just, I go quiet. And I tell the girls, please don't talk to me unless it's necessary. But even then you get separated. So you've, you're in your leg one, leg two. So everyone like you're just sitting there in a, a line with all the other foreigners. And you just, I just sit there. Like I'm probably best don't talk to me just because too much talking will only take away a lot of my energy and like you try to make small jokes and like try and get the like the group to mm. when we are together before just before we walk out just to make each other smile or whatever. But even then, I just go quiet. And not me, I'm like the bubbliest one. Like I'm like not say the the mother hen, but I am like the big sister that everyone comes to and we mess around, we have fun. But that moment, I'm like, yeah, this is just this be quiet. Thanks. Like talk to me if you need to talk to me. But then I make a small joke and then I go back to being quiet. And then make a joke and okay, go back to being quiet because this is Olympic final. Mm-hmm. Like you, you're not going to get this yeah, again. Yeah, you've got to probably keep telling yeah. yourself, being like. 
Stress. You're literally at the Olympics. And you've got first leg. You can't full start. I'm touched with that. This, this, that can't happen. <laughs> you have the battle and you You're have to give the... You're always first leg, aren't you? That's yeah. your... Yeah. I, I never used to be. As a youth, I used to be last. And then one of the coaches put me first and I never went back since. And I feel really? like that's just, I'm just happy with it though because I passed the baton. Yeah. And that's a you problem Job now, done. guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't. Just I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all yeah. you guys. You, I mean, I trust them, yeah. but yeah. I've done it now. So I've done what I needed to do. Okay, yeah. now you guys can carry it around. And then we train really well. I can trust these girls now. We've we've grown since, obviously, 2012, we didn't have a, a team. Uh, well, that was, let's say I was still a junior, let's say a, a mini junior, I come back from the injury. So I was in and out of the sport still. But um, when we didn't have a team there, I thought they had to, you know, put some funding and some effort back into the relay teams. And then ever since then, Rio 2016, we've just been getting medals, 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 medals. Yeah. So it was a good thing that they did that. We've been working really hard. So the team is like, we, you can put, trust any of the girls on any of the legs now. It's that solid. And we're top three now. We could say um, it fluctuates from America, Jamaica and us. It, I mean, we still haven't had our gold yet, but it's close. I know to think we could have a gold was a bit far fetched because they got the you know the, the top the three fastest women alive practically at the moment on that leg. So we was expecting a world record from them, but um, you know just to probably get second <laughs> would have been nice. We just run another national record to get that, but um, no, it was nice. It was it's a great experience being with other girls. You can like for the rest of your life. And, oh, okay, I did this with these girls, and you can mm. talk about it. it's like a moment that you're bonded for. And it's it's a great feeling. As much as you would like an individual medal as well, but when you it's a team effort and you watch the baton get round and you watch some your, your last leg run across the line, you go, oh, he's got a medal. Like. And then obviously you bring it home and everyone's so excited about it because you guys don't see, obviously the stresses behind us doing all the sports, just the hard work, the arguments behind the scenes, or who doesn't get to run, this person doesn't get to run, I've worked hard, this person didn't get picked. Um, just a year of just the stress that you went into, like... Everyone's like thinking, but aren't you guys excited? We are excited, but we're just exhausted at the same time. Like we finally did it, but we're tired. Like, yeah. how did we manage to get through that far and just come back with another medal? Like, and especially knowing that our changeovers were, you know, nail biting moments. Like, did we get it in? We're not sure. So we're waiting at the line thinking, did we get DQ? No. Okay. What, just keep waiting. Just keep waiting. <laughs> what's classed as a as a DQ on a relay? Obviously, if you drop it. If you drop it, if you don't get it in between thirty oh. meters, yeah. It is, and the thing is, you don't you know like the matrix. You know when you've got those calculations. Yeah. I swear to you, that is what I go through <laughs> in those moments. You don't understand. Like she's run off now, and you're thinking, okay, has she gone off too fast? Has she gone off early? Has she done this? Has she done that? Blah blah this. But and honestly, they say it's the ingoing runner's um, fault if anything happens anyway. Because if you don't get that button, you meant to call early to let her know, yeah. or like shout, and like it was even better because she could hear me because there was no crowd. Switzerland I shouted her name she didn't hear me and I was like can you like I will say your full government name if I have to because <laughs> um, I shouted out hand in Switzerland and obviously she put her hand back she didn't hear me I was like by then I've now run up like too close to her and then she said and then she finally heard me shout hand and it's like oh the hand the button goes in I'm like trying to shove it in here yeah. but whereas obviously there's meant to be a space and you're meant to reach for it but obviously she could hear me in, in Tokyo but um honestly you have got so much calculations when you feel like can I catch her I don't think I can catch her but you've got to stay positive you can't back off you've got to do this and it's just going and then you've got 30 metres it's like I don't know how many seconds that is but you have to make the right decision at that right moment and she's running fucking hard as well yeah she's gone out she's gone yeah. So you're like, not so you don't shout stop, but you shout, if you know you can't catch her, you shout hand early. Then when you realise that her hand's still there, then she will understand that I'm not there and yeah. she'd like to start to slow down. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a, a communication that you guys have. It's like a, a bond. A chemistry. Yeah, yeah. That, that is a massive chemistry because bearing in mind, we'll do it at training and we'll get the baton around all the time in training, but you'll just never understand when things go wrong. And so we've got a new girl on the team, um, Beth, she ran the 200 metres. And then when we're trying to teach her to do, she's done relays before, but not so much at such a high level mm -hmm. before. And she's been thrown in the deep end several times, but you can only learn whilst you're on the job. So the amount of times you do training, it's like the ones we get wrong are the ones you want to learn from because mm -hmm. you know what to do next. Okay, oh, I get it and I understand. Because you don't want too many people talking to you in your head like, oh, you should do this, you should do that. I said, like, no, there's too much information. I'm like, Beth, just take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. Go around again and see how that one goes. And then whatever you take your notes and figure out what went well and what went wrong and then work from it from there. And then she would understand, oh, I went too hard or I did this, I should have done that. Or I said, called hand too early because you want them to get off at a certain point. And then like, because if they got off too slow or they didn't get off like on time, you want them to 
get a bit of speed and then pass the baton. So it's all these conversations you're having with yourself and just watching the person in front. You gotta know where their hand goes. Does their hand always go high? Does it always drop? Like, because they could be doing this, and you gotta learn how to just really just push in the baton. And honestly, training I hate cutting the baton because that practice of slamming the baton into your hand all the time is horrible. So I'm glad I don't have to. Do- I mean, I do sometimes in the warm up, but I don't like doing that part. Have you have you ever been at a super high competition where it's been dropped? Uh, so we, you know, the Diamond League in it used to be in Crystal Palace before it moved to the Olympic Stadium. Mm-hmm. Like I remember, I was like third leg, and I think I just had a panic attack, and I just um, I was like still a junior. They had all these big girls running into me, and I just wasn't listening. I think I don't know if my body said, "Ashat, no, you're not doing this," even though, and I just Stop. the, the baton, yeah, the baton just didn't get round. I just I think I just panicked as a child. When I look back at it, I was just really terrified. But that was my only moment. But it hasn't happened since, thank God, because um, I'm in control now. So I you know probably what's learned on. from that yeah. anyway, didn't you? Yeah. Thinking, wow, don't want yeah. that to happen again. Never. No. And learning from. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I did not realize it was that calculated. <laughs> All we had to do with swimming was make sure that hand touches Touch. the wall yeah. before you dive off to not to get DQ. Just high five and that's what. Yeah. Mm. High five and go. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ours wasn't as stressful. Yeah. So one of the one of the things we were speaking about yesterday was people who are successful who have to make sacrifices and I'm mm-hmm. sure as one of the most successful female athletes on earth you will have had to make mm-hmm. sacrifices through your career what sort of things do you feel like compared to an everyday person who's maybe working 9 mm-hmm. to 5 things that you potentially have to sacrifice or give up in your life and potentially those things that you kind of wish you would have maybe had mm-hmm. more of and, and obviously like you, you give that up for a reason because you're mm-hmm. successful athlete and you enjoy and you love doing sport but we were talking about yesterday with another guest of kind of those risks and sacrifices you have to make in order to become mm-hmm. successful that people potentially think that they want to be at that level but then don't realize kind of the, the iceberg of all that stuff that that really leads up to being at that level as well so i had a psychologist was well, sports psychologist i think everyone needs to be anyone in life needs a psychologist <laughs> i'll agree yeah um and we spoke one time and she said and I always, I actually hold this dearly to my heart. Says we never make, it's never a sacrifice because it's always a negative word. So we turn it into, we make choices. I feel like, okay, I get you, understand. So it's not um, like I sacrificed eating a chocolate bar for this race. So no, I made a choice to not eat that chocolate bar because I know it would help mm-hmm. my career. I know I use a chocolate bar, but that just seems to be the thing at the moment. But um, so I never say the word sacrifice anymore just because I feel like it stresses me. But I feel the choices that I've made, obviously I moved to my coach. He was in Loughborough when I first went. And now, like I said, I'm a London girl, don't mm-hmm. want to leave. I'm like, if it's for a couple of weeks for a training camp, then I can come back home. But I went to Loughborough for three years and that was an experience just because obviously I didn't go to uni there. So it was like I had to make friends mm-hmm. or find a different environment. And like I said, I'm at home, but I couldn't just go home. Even though it was like a two hour journey, it was just it's too much every weekend to keep doing. Um, so that was a decision I made, a choice. And uh, it was tough because um, my niece was... She know, like she was like three or four at the time, and um, we, were, we were like, she's like my baby. Like I go, I used to take her everywhere. She's a spoiler, and um, when I went, I just feel like she just kind of forgot about me. Like she just grew up, and like mm-hmm. I wasn't her number one anymore. Or like my nephew. So he was when I was at my mom's at the time. He was still living with us. Um, every morning he used to come and give me a kiss before I left to go before he went to the nursery. Every day without fail he would wake me up climb on my face give me a kiss and then leave and then that I missed out on all those kisses and um he then started to favor my other cousin like he would like call her all the time I'm like oh so my babies don't want me anymore <laughs> so that would that that hurt me because when I tell you that these are my kids that they are mine like I would raise them like if they if they're, my brother or my sisters weren't about I would take them on board because that's how much I love um my nieces and nephews so when I missed out on those three years I think that hurt me a lot knowing that I wasn't their number one anymore. So I have to like bribe them with other things. <laughs> but uh, I think those are the hardest things I think I had to make. When I go to like training camps and stuff, that's not so bad. I do miss out on birthdays. So my cousin's getting actually married next year. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm out, I can go. And obviously, I mean, I would, I'm going to be a bridesmaid. So I think I'm going to make the decision to say, I'm not going to go on a training camp mm-hmm. and stay at home and go to for her wedding. And I'm hoping that my group will go to Europe for a training camp rather than America, so then I can just travel back and forth and that would be easier. Yeah. Whereas if I was in America, I couldn't just jump on a plane and just come back with Portugal for training there. Mm-hmm. That's what a two-hour flight, if that, and it's it's just easy in and out and I can I can literally just go back. 
But so that's another conversation I want to have with my coach. I said, oh, she's getting married. I can't miss it. So sorry. But usually we go to America to start racing because like it's a big year next year and the season's going to start earlier than it would be later. So it's all these decisions and they're hard. They're tough choices. And it's like, can I not do this to make that? Or can I do that to do this? And it's like, you have to really have a conversation with yourself. Okay, how bad do you want this? How bad do you mm-hmm. want that? What is your priorities? What do you put first? And it's all about just planning. And I think I work well with planning. Only because um, if I say I've got to do this, 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 and this, it would all work out well. And it's it's great. Now I can understand how I'm in control because there's certain things you're not in control of. And I think you have to learn that. So when you're in a race, you can't control what anyone else is doing in that. You just have to learn what you can do. And I've learned that I have to really zone into that and just focus on what I can do for myself as an athlete as my or for my profession. What is good for me and how would I work with it and push forward with it? So if I can't go to this event, I can only apologise. I'll be like, obviously upset, but I'm sorry, I have to do it for my, um, my sport. So my family know I've missed out on so many things. Like I said, we're very close. And... They will understand it now. Even like, because, oh, you're always away. Why don't you ever be here? Da, da, da. Like, that breaks your heart. And I think I'm yeah. not even a mom. And I, I'm feeling when they're telling me, like, well, I'm sorry, I try. I can't do everything. But um, you just have to really make the best decision. And you said it's only for a short period in life mm-hmm. because sport is not going to last forever. Yeah. I've probably got three, four years max left. I say max. I don't think I'll go any further just because I want to try a new venture. Maybe I've done sport since I could walk. But I'm like, you're going to stop too early. And plus, I don't want to leave injured or leave on someone else's terms yeah. like that injury made me leave trampolining and I still wish would should have would have could have kind of thing about it and I don't want to do that with track so I want to make sure I could you know leave with all my well, a smile let's just say mm-hmm. and um so I want to give it all like if I have to not go to your birthday party or not go to this wedding or not do so well, I'm sorry like well you know what I do for a living you could have <laughs> decided yeah. I'm, not, I'm not trying to say you should work it around me I mean I'm not a princess or anything but <laughs> But I wish that they could make, uh, just just think about me in their decision yeah. making. Like, I know she's probably going for Hindu. I'm like, well, I'm definitely not going. If you're going to board, don't ask me to come. Like, you can't have your wedding and the Hindu. Now you have to make a decision. <laughs> yeah, you have yeah. one. Yeah. Just one. So, yeah. So, but then I'm okay that, to miss out on certain things. Yeah. And I can accept that. Because I know I paid for my friend's wedding before and I missed out on her Oh, so I paid for the her Hindu and I lost out on that and not going. But at least, I mean, I paid just to see if I could try. And mm-hmm. I'm always like, if I, I'm that trial, like, maybe, yes, we can do this. But if I can't, I tried. Yeah. But mm-hmm. mostly, you, I have to learn to put myself first because I never do that. I always put someone before me. And it was always my family first. I, mean, I would tell what how do they feel? How does someone else feel? I never, I remember because I'm a nice person. And I think some people take my kindness a weakness as well, uh, that I would always put someone else before me. And I thought like, no, when I said, okay, it's about me now, this is my Olympic career. Like, thank you, I did it because obviously I made the championships. But like I said, I've only got that many, a few more years left. So why am I going to give someone else the opportunity to, well, why, yeah, why am I giving myself, giving someone the opportunity to kind of like dampen on it? Mm-hmm. So I was like, no, I should like, you know what? You'll see them when you finish. My mom always said to me, Ash, when you turn 30 or 40, they're still going to have the same parties that they're having back in the day. They're still going to play the same music. They're still going to do this. I'm thinking, well, you're right. I'm here now. Yeah. <laughs> and I can see it. <laughs> so um, that's why I just, I, I just put myself forward, make my decisions for myself, for my career. And then hopefully everything alongside it will just, it will be there. If I can go, I can. I can. If I can't, I yeah. can't. I mean, so that's, that's really important way. what you touched I on there. That's so important. We, we yeah. explained what this before and there's that old saying of you should treat your neighbour how you'd want to be treated yes. but I think that so many people should treat themselves how they would treat other people mm-hmm. because we're often just a massive yeah. dick to ourselves and we never yeah. look after ourselves first so I think that's really important the other thing that's interesting is and I'm quite curious about is the do you say you have a sports psychologist as mm-hmm. well how often can you in contact with them and like does that do, do all athletes have a sports psychologist And mm, I don't think all athletes have one but I believe that they should uh, I have been working with one for this whole year and I speak to her once a week. My aunt is a qualified psychologist herself and she says, no, I think you need about three times a week. I'm thinking, oh God, wow, you've got to talk about three times a week. <laughs> I thought, like, what can you talk about? Like, I've yeah. spoken to you about two days ago, how much more can you do? But um, I think they are the best thing. I wish I had it when I did my knee, but I think because that's when I like sunk into like a really bad place because mm-hmm. like, I'm very much outgoing. It took a while for me to bring back that confidence and that bubbly person. Um, but a psychologist, I feel like, because we believe we can do everything by ourselves. And that saying, and it takes a village to raise a, a, village to raise a child, I believe it is true. Mm-hmm. 
and I'm so I still may be an adult, but I'm still somebody else's child. <laughs> yeah. And I believe that I need my village. I need um I call it an energy bus book. I I read this book and I believe everything is like I'm on this bus and I need someone to be my wing mirror, someone to help me fix my tires, I need someone to be my blind spot. And I feel you need that. And sometimes you get annoyed with your tire and you need to have a word with that tire. Like, How do I have a word with this tire? <laughs> you go and talk to your psychologist and she'll help you talk about it. And you um, discuss things that you probably wouldn't talk to anybody else on this bus about. Um, because not everyone would understand. So my aunt always thinks, um, no, so, so my family are teachers and they might have a problem with one of their teachers. And like, well, why don't you just tell them off or tell them about themselves or do something to, you know, get them off your back. Like, oh, you can't do this protocol, this, this, that, and the other. And then same way, Someone will tell me, oh, Asha, you maybe should do this. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. I said, well, you're not here. Like, this is a different world. Like, I can't tell you what to do for your profession because you don't know how to do it with my profession. So you have to learn, like, some things may help. We can discuss it. But I'd rather you talk about it rather than you tell me what to do in my job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you don't know what I have to go through 24-7. This is my daily basis. Like, this is my day-to-day -day thing. So I need you to understand from my point of view and how how my my work is. So when it comes to psychologists, I just feel she, she kind of just she never obviously never tells she never tells me what to do, but you know when you're offloading and you kind of understand and she kind of guides you in a way to make your own decision and figure out your own things and I think that's what we need because we bottle up so much and we never talk about it and I think as we get older our mental health is so important especially with social media right now and everyone thinking oh we should be this or oh, I should have what she's having and this that, and the other when you're like no this is your lane. And this is how like, I might not be blessed in like having the fastest car or a nice big house as other athletes, but I'm blessed in having a great family or, you know, being able to run fast and make a championship. And some people haven't. So you've got to learn how to just obviously bring it back to yourself again and obviously just talk to her. And I'm saying her because she's a female. Mm. But um, but yeah, I, I would advise a psychologist to everyone mm -hmm. because even when it comes to like, say our partners or whoever, I wouldn't even offload to everyone close to me. Yeah. But I would offload to her. So my mum gets a bit upset because I talk to my aunt more than I talk to her about things because she's my mum. I'm yeah. like, mum, but your mum. I can't, <laughs> I, can't get, uh, yeah, I, can't, yeah. I can't give you that. But I'll give her some drips and drabs, but I'll go to my aunt because not saying my mum isn't qualified. She's a qualified counsellor too. But my aunt just has that that edge and she'll tell me. Same way one of my other counsellors, my other cousins, she kind of has what my aunt has and I'll talk to her about things. But it's just, it's a good thing. I think athletes do need it because mm -hmm. it's hard. We go to a championship and so we perform, like I did perform the, way, the best way I wanted to. Yeah, I've got a medal on the relay, but if I'm talking about my individual performance, I didn't do as well as I should have. It's like you work so hard for these 11 seconds and then it's just like, it's gone just like that. Okay, cool, on to next championships. And I didn't perform how I wanted to. And it's like, okay, how do I pick myself up from that? So same way of picking myself up from performing badly, watching everyone else perform well, and then I will go and do a relay now. It's like, how do I deal with that? Mm -hmm. you, ha you need to talk to someone about it because... Me bottling it up and then saying, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. When you're truly, you're not fine. And they're always that sign, how are you? Are you fine? It's always a lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's just talking to someone about it, offloading. And, you know, as soon as I've offloaded, I feel like I'm a brand new person. Like, honestly, I've said what I need to say and I'm like, oh, I feel good now. Okay, yeah, I can start the day. Yeah. And that's what you need. You need to offload to someone, someone that's not going to judge you, just to listen. And it's always just someone that's going to listen. I don't need to talk, just to listen to what I've got to say. Yeah. So I, I would advise therapy for everybody. I think that's so important what you just touched on there, like so, so, mm -hmm. so important because personally I can only imagine how difficult, mm -hmm. difficult it is in your shoes because we talk about a lot of the time when people are using social media to compare themselves to other people and mm -hmm. like often comparisons are for joy. Yeah. Your job is literally to compare times yeah. and performances <laughs> to other people which can, yeah. must be so mentally draining and especially for people going through the time of COVID and stuff and me and Lucy have been very open about um, having a therapist over mm -hmm. like the last year and how amazing it's been for us just being able to have someone to not a couple therapists <laughs> <laughs> we've had not, separate not, therapists not just yet it hasn't gone that bad <laughs> <laughs> but having someone to a professional listener to speak yes. to makes such a difference yeah and um, I think because the industry that we work in on social media and stuff is you're constantly looking at the hyper elite mm -hmm. and comparing so, and that that applies to us as well mm. that's why we're, why we're very transparent to other people about it because if it helps someone else resonate yeah. or late then I think it can help them and it's just so nice to hear it from mm. someone of, of your level of athlete as well kind of yeah. go through those things mm -hmm. and how important it is for you to have that other person on the other side to just sit there and listen yeah. and obviously it was it was a big thing in this Olympics as well wasn't it with I think it was it Biles the gymnast who oh, yeah, yeah, ended yeah. up pulling yeah. out yeah Simone and, yeah and it obviously mm -hmm. opened up a whole discussion about mental health as well yeah. how important it is 
Um, again, there's always kind of two two different camps whenever big decisions are made like that. And I, you see some horrible things online and comments that people are mm-hmm. making. She's she's a top level athlete. She shouldn't be doing stuff like that. She shouldn't be pulling out. It's a disgrace. And mm-hmm. and like she's a young female who's mm-hmm. at the end of the day above all else, like we just said, a human being, not just an athlete. And the yep. way that people get treated yep. even after that when she's in a vulnerable position already, I just can't even it's hard. Co- comprehend her. Do you know, I think people forget because um, it's like, okay, if you took an... So bring back into a teacher, if you do make a mistake or you are sick, you can take a day off. We can't. Like mm-hmm. you said, you've gone to the championships and they're saying, you're not going to take a day off today because you're about to go and compete at the Olympics. But it said you're not mentally there and you can't physically do mm-hmm. it. And it's just like, how can you tell someone that's not well, I say not well, as in they're just not ready, they're, they're not mentally ready to compete. Like you can't force someone to do that. But so why should you force someone to go to work if they can't do that? Like it's it's unfair. And different jobs are just very different because we're in the public eye and she's got how many million followers and stuff like that. They're, she's expected to do it. But how can we be expected to do something if I if I physically can't, my, my mental state of mind cannot allow me to do it. Mm. Like, so say I've just finished my race and my coach, I, I normally go to September, but I haven't had the best year this year. So I'm just like, I really can't go anymore. And my coach said, are you sure? It's like, I am positive. So the 1st of September, I'm done because you're making me, I'm I'm not running as fast as I want to, but you want me to go and race and then wait, like race probably even worse. I like get a slower time just because my head is not in the right position. So he understands that and said, okay, Asha, we're going to finish the season there and we're going to, well, I did a 200. So that's obviously not my main event. So it was more, it was fun for me to do that. But if you asked me to go and do a hundred, I said, my, my head space isn't there. I, I physically cannot get on the track and do it. The relay is fine because I'm passing the button. Yeah. It's banter, it's with the girls, it's more relaxed. But for me to go and do another hundred meters, I couldn't do it. So it's like, why would I force someone to go into a gymnast, be spinning up and down, we can hurt themselves and they're not mentally there. You, you can't do that. It's, yeah. it's, it's out of order. You're forgetting, like I said, we are human first mm-hmm. before we are Olympic athletes. Like, we're allowed to have our down days, but according to the rest of the world, we're not allowed. you've made yeah. it this far, you've taken someone else's spot. So I didn't get this far and then say, oh, now I've turned crazy, I don't want to I don't want to um, compete. It's just like, I've got to a point and I've had basically stage fright and I can't physically go out there and perform. And I think people need to understand that because it is quite tough. I think the thing is, if she would have had a physical injury and pulled mm. out, no one would have said anything. It's true, yeah. But because it was a, a mental, which yeah. is, is, is yeah. even worse for a lot of people, like it's, mm. it's 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 unbelievable. And I think that she's came out and did that. Like we said, we are talking about today. Mm-hmm. It's opened up conversations where potentially people wouldn't have spoken about before, and mm-hmm. people would just, like we said, bottled up on their own. Yeah. And I think we've done a lot a positive off mm-hmm. the back of it for the sport and for athletes to kind of feel like that pressure's lifted from feeling like they can't speak about it or they needed to. Do you know what it scares me so? Because obviously there's a, the suicide rate is going up as well. And I feel like you, and obviously it's when it comes to young men, they don't like to discuss a lot of things. With yeah. us girls, we would talk a lot, but even though we wouldn't go as far, but at least we would, we would discuss a certain, like a few subjects, I should say. But for men, they don't discuss it a lot. Because I know my brother, he closed off with, with us at one point and he just didn't really talk to us or we didn't realise how bad he was doing in his work or whatever. He just never spoke to us. And then one day he just came and spoke to us and thinking, wow, you were going for all this and you didn't want to tell us. Like, but we're here for you. Like we're a, like a supportive family, but yet he knows that, but he still couldn't get the words out to physically tell us. So it's like, when you, well now I've, I talk about therapy all the time. So when someone's someone, I think she's going to get therapy. I think she's going to get therapy. But it's not like I'm saying it just because um, I feel like you're, you know, you're not saying you're going crazy. We're talking to a shrink and then all that kind of the bad neg- the negative uh, connotations to it. But it's just, you could just, it just takes off another load. Mm-hmm. And it just, it changes your life. Yeah. And I feel like, I, when I told my brother, I said, that, yeah, just go and get therapy. Go and talk to someone. Go and, uh, go and talk to Auntie Faye. That's why I said, go and talk to her aunt and she'll sort you out. <laughs> And you'll be fine. But it's just, some people feel like maybe because they can't afford it, they can't do it. But then even so, you can find a friend that you can trust. Mm-hmm. And I think that's always the hardest thing because people still don't know how to offload to their friends. But I always say, just find some, just find that one person. Even in, you know, record yourself, just talking. I've got Wilson now. They're my, um, <laughs> my bull from Castaway. And I talk to Wilson at home if I, <laughs> if I need to have a word or something. <laughs> no one's in the house and no one's talked to him. Like, Wilson, I've had a tough day today. You know? <laughs> but no, you just need to, I feel like, because he went through that stuff and I just feel like, you know what, I need you to go and talk to someone or, you know, we're here for you. But I am like pro-advocate, like everyone needs therapy. Even if it's just like, if you're not even going through anything, just talk. Just if you want someone to talk to, just do it because it is so healthy. So healthy. 100%. I think we're also, especially with the field that we're in, like Mm -hmm. of athletics or uh, coaching, 
we are always the first ones to advocate looking after physical health. Mm -hmm. But then we're never, we're always reactive rather than proactive with, mm -hmm. with mental health. And we sort of have these pillars in life which hold us up. And obviously like physical is yeah. one of them and the psychological part is the other. And all these pillars are kind of running in unison to make sure we're held up as a, as a person mm -hmm. in society today. But as, one, as soon as one of those goes, we're fucked. Yeah. That, that's yeah. the big one that we never, ever talk about. As you said, especially for, for males. Was it your brother who... Yeah, well, I just feel like he just closed off on us. Yeah, yeah. and again, like the first time I ever spoke about it because during the first lockdown, I was at the point where I was contemplating taking my own life and mm. my mum didn't even know about it until I spoke about it on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I think she was really worried about it. And and again, I didn't feel like I could speak to her mm -hmm. about it. Um, but again, I had the therapist about it. I felt like I could speak to Lucy about it to a certain degree. And But you, you spoke to the therapist first about it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's one of those things that even though you can be so yeah. close to someone, there's sometimes you have to talk to a third party yeah. person. It's they don't have a mm. clue about anything. So I'm mm. going to speak to them, and that's cool. Well, the amount of people that came after we released that podcast and spoke about it was unbelievable. And I think these kind of conversations mm. are so important for other people then to resonate to, and then for them to go and speak to someone yeah. else about it as well. Yeah. So a, a massive thank you for obviously speaking about her. And, no, and I'm, of... I am here for it. I will, honestly, once a week I was talking to my psychologist, even if it was not even to talk about track, she would just listen and say, oh, actually, if you want to talk about something else in your life, boys, your mum, this, any other, that you can just just talk. And I, I'm so pro it because I don't want to see, like, I don't want to lose a friend to, mm -hmm. to someone's mental health, like knowing that I could have helped. Because then it feels like like I could have done something, but then I would never have known had you not told me. Mm -hmm. But then it's like I can't, pull, I can't you know draw blood from a stone if yeah. you're not giving me that that bit to just say, oh, can we just talk about this subject? But I always ask people like, how are you? How's things? And I would, maybe because I'm that friend, I will go a bit deeper. And I, now I know um, listening to other um, podcasts and stuff saying, well, no podcasts, that's like, people talking about if I'm not in the mental space, space of mind to hold your energy, then I can't discuss it. So I'll be like. Am I in a good place? You know, I can talk about it with you. So, are you okay? I said, I can. When you say offload to me, I'm here for you. But sometimes we're like, you know what? I can't take it today because my head isn't in the right space. Yeah. So, I also have to protect myself first as well. So, I've learned to do that as well. So, so you know what? Come to me tomorrow and I'll be there for you. But um, I always know, I always have to check into my close friends just to make sure that how is everything? Are you okay? But even then, they can still lie to me. But mm -hmm. at least I know I tried. Yeah. Um, the worst thing is if I didn't try and um, I didn't know about it, then it would have been worse for me. So there's a girl um, who I went to secondary school with. Uh, this is the reason why I think I, I would adopt two kids if I could, if I could physically afford it and <laughs> later on in life. But I feel like if I had the space anyway, so, but if I would adopt a pair, they have to be siblings because one of them, I was on a training camp and I found out she committed suicide, left her daughter behind. And it was, it kind of hurt my feelings because like I said, my family are so close and to know that she didn't have that family along with her to support her, I feel um, I could have been there to change her life. Even though it wasn't close, she still affected me from being in school, yeah. knowing how my family was so different to hers. And I feel like, had I spoken to her, had I said something, maybe things could have been different had I been closer to her. Just all those little things just run through your mind. And you, I just feel like it, it affected me so badly. I was like, and how is this affecting me? And I thought from that day, I thought, okay, you know what? I'm adopt two kids. So I hope that is my future. I would like to have two kids in my family that aren't mine, but I know I could have changed someone else's life knowing that I tried but because like just I just I just couldn't have someone else I know lose their mm -hmm. life to that knowing all they had to do is ask you are you okay do you need someone to talk to is there anyone out there I can help you with like like I said sometimes I do put myself first in those situations but I have that mental space to do it at that moment yeah. like I said, if I couldn't obviously I say you know what come to me tomorrow we'll discuss this then but at least I want to know so like now my niece is starting secondary school tomorrow I'm like this week I'm like so how are things are you going to be okay? Yeah. Are you like this? Like, this is what's going to happen. This, that, and the other one. We have all the little talks and the, the, the big girl talks are going to come out soon. So, <laughs> be ready for yeah, one. <laughs> they're coming out. <laughs> Whether she likes it or not, we're going to have this discussion. <laughs> but like, it's like, I want to make sure that she's okay because obviously like, this world is different for them now because yeah. obviously social media is just, I don't want to think, you know, she doesn't have the nicest bag. She doesn't have the nicest trainers. I said, well, I don't care. You're going to scuff them up anyway. Yeah. You're not wearing them to school or whatever. But I just feel, I want to make sure she's going to be okay. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I just, I just know, I just couldn't, me, but I could, couldn't hold someone losing their life on my shoulders. Yeah. But now I know I've been exposed to therapy, I will throw in everyone's face, like, mm. yeah, you need this, you need this. And even one of the track boys, um, he told me about it, that he started getting therapy. And I, I hugged him 
and he felt so happy that I hugged him and felt like Asha like I didn't want to be judged or this and the other said how could you be judged this is one of the best things you could ever do in life and then he was so happy he was so happy like that I responded so well just for him I said yeah I'm ha- you everyone on this podcast please go get therapy you know you need it <laughs> but it's like it's just really just for just for you your own benefit just ugh, that one conversation can change your whole life even today I just told my niece um, I said to her I saw a girl she looked really cute in a, her outfit I said oh my god I really like your outfit she said like, why do you say that because so that could change someone's whole day yeah, yeah. so me saying you look really pretty today oh I like your shoes your outfit your makeup whatever I just said something nice to someone and I hope that changed their day even they had a smile on their face I don't know but you saw the light her face just lit up yeah. I feel like that's all you need to do to people just tell them you look great today and yeah Oh, you're such a pleasure to talk. <laughs> Honestly, I'd be like that listen like, with a big smile on my face. I think, it's cool. I think it's all that positive energy about it because I feel like the reason why people don't go to therapy or don't talk about it is because mm-hmm. it's always seen in a negative light or yeah. like something's wrong with you if you go and Yeah, or you're going to shrink. Oh, yeah, right. exactly. So to, to have that spoken about yourself and like with a positive energy around yeah. it, I think it's probably for that guy that you spoke to from the truck mm-hmm. or whatever as well, probably just changed his whole perspective yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. And, and he probably potentially would have been more committed to it as mm-hmm. well. One of the the other things that I kind of, again around the the mental health element. I know Lucy spoke about before when she finished swimming, and she needed something after that to go yeah. into to kind of because you an athlete at that level, you need some yeah. some refocus. What do you feel like for you would be that? Have you got like another focus after athletics or, or drawing, or have you got something that you enjoy doing that you kind of can see yourself splitting off into? Do you know it's going to be really hard when I get to that point and that crossroad because. Obviously, I've done sport my whole mm-hmm. life. I've not known anything but sports. And I'm thinking, okay, Ash, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. Like, everyone gets, you go to uni, you still take a degree, and you still, I, am I going to yeah. use it? I still don't know. But um, I feel like I studied drama. <laughs> Funny. <you> know, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel I'll probably go into theatre, maybe, or behind the scenes, or just go into acting or something. Because that was that's oh, that has been always been my passion to do. But I would just put it on hold because of sports. Mm-hmm. And I see my friends doing so well now that I went to drama school with and stuff. And I feel like, oh, you're doing so well. Like, oh, am I jealous? I don't know, but I'm here at the Olympics. How can I be jealous? Like, this is another passion of mine. But you want it all, don't you? You want to have mm-hmm. to have yeah. everything. But um, I probably would go into something like that. I don't know... I probably I, I, I don't know I probably say oh, I'm going to travel for a year but I'll probably get bored after like 10 minutes <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I know I'm going to have I've literally just this is my first day off and it's going to take me like two weeks and I'm like oh I'm going to miss the gym like I love the gym more than running when it comes to running so I feel like <laughs> I'm going to miss doing some sort of physical fitness so I'll probably still stay fit maybe because I like the body yeah. that comes with it because um, I know I will, I will just put on a couple pounds I mean I could do that in the space of three weeks <laughs> you'll see <laughs> um, but I don't know I haven't really pinpointed what I wanted to do um, my family said I can always be a teacher because they were teachers and stuff but do I really want to work do I really want to get a job mm-hmm. like it was a, do I really want to do labour I don't know yeah. I just want to lie down and then when I decide to get up I'll get up <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what I want to do if I, do you know I mean? like, it's more I like of a, um, agency work my mom was because like, my yeah so now my family is retired like they do agency they'll go in when they want to go and I feel like that's mm-hmm. what I want to do yeah. I want to do agency call me if you need me oh yeah. today's not date now maybe tomorrow like I think that's what I'm going into but I don't know I'm really scared I'm not scared but I'm going to be excited for the next adventure yeah. that when it comes to it I suppose so many things can change in such a short period of time yeah. especially like the, the, the way that the world is mm. with social media and everything else that comes with it so there may be something else that crops up in the path and kind of just spins you off in a yeah a something might come next week and I might feel like this might be it yeah, yeah. I might just go tomorrow yeah. but until then I'm going to hold on <laughs> well because the next Olympics is like, it's three years but I understand it's three more winters yes. of training <laughs> and winter training is death Yes. And you lie on the track and you're thinking, why on earth am I coming? Like, why am I here? Breath, yeah. Like, yeah. You just, yes. Cold coming and out. And your head starts steaming. Like, how is that possible? Yeah. Like, I get so angry thinking, why <laughs> Why do I get back up and do it again? Like, knowing what I'm going to go into in October, I must be stupid. I think all athletes aren't correct. <laughs> We're wired differently because how dare we die, throw up one day and then think it's okay to get up and do it the next. Yeah. We're stupid. I think we're definitely stupid as well. But um, I feel like I'll go into, you know, that winter, I think three more winters. Can I go to Olympics? I don't know. But obviously next year's another big year. It's a home championship. So I'll have a discussion with myself then. Okay, yeah. do I want to go again? Okay, we'll see. And then we'll go on from there. But I am looking forward to what else my What's life has to bring. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not so upset about listen, missing out on other people's lives or stuff that they're doing because I know the end is near for the sport. So I don't know. 
We're still so young as well, so there's there's other chapters to there's still the chapters unfold, and then there's another yeah. part of your life that will open up it. At some point, wherever that may be. It's true. I'm supposed to be a mum one day or this, any of them. I'm like, I don't know. I'm still a great auntie right now. I just like giving them back. Yeah, yeah you're the back I at the like, end of the day. Yeah, I'm giving them back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, so. I mean, this part, I was just looking at my face. It's like a smile. A smile. Um, no, Ashley, you have been incredible. And I honestly feel so many people can listen to this podcast and be like, yeah, I, mm. I needed to hear that today. Like, whatever. Because you don't, you never know what someone's going through who's listening. Mm. Complete wide audience that we have in general for mm-hmm. our pa- uh, pa- podcast, <laughs> our podcast as well. So just for people who maybe... Live under a rock. Live under a rock, yeah. Mm-hmm. Where can people find you? Where can people find you? Instagram, you, I think you just started YouTube. Just started, yeah. You just started YouTube, just yeah. Just started the behind um, the scenes of the Olympics. So <laughs> that's so sick. That's like of me. I'm already subscribed. But um, <laughs> where can people find more about you? I just don't even know my YouTube name on that. It's that thing. Just it's on my Instagram anyway. Let's yeah. just say that. <laughs> yeah. So, it's Asha Phillip, isn't it? Yeah, well, Miss Asha Phillip. Miss I feel Asha like Phillip. I feel like more of an adult, but it's M I double S, but yeah. it should be Princess yeah. Asha Phillip. Yeah. You never know. Harry's no one married now, actually, aren't they? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Probably find another foreign um royal family. But yeah, my name is Miss Asha Phillip on Instagram and Twitter. I'm not really a Twitter girl, but I'm trying to get back into it. Mm. But that's Twitter's my main one. Mm. Yeah. It? It's a bit of a I I don't know when the last time I tweeted was. Mm. It can be a bit of a place kind of to it sometimes. It is. Yeah. I just feel like I'm not there the today. Day. But I'm all for cussing on Instagram. If you need me, so <laughs> even today, I went into Zara and the man was giving me attitude. I said, I not today. Yeah, drink. I was like, you don't need to be. So, yeah. today, I'm not trying to catch a case today. So please, I'm taking a deep breath. I said, I walked out the shop. I said, you know what? You're having a bad day. I'm not going to hold it to you. So you don't know, I don't know what his energy was at. You never know, he might have had a bad day. But yeah, I'm yeah. here just trying to buy clothes. That's all I'm trying to do. There's yeah. no need for whatever energy you're giving me. But I'm just going to take a deep breath. I said, today's not the day. I might come for you tomorrow. But today's not today. <laughs> amazing <laughs> oh well no thanks so much we appreciate it yeah, appreciate oh no thanks for having me I loved it it was fun thank you it was amazing um, for all those who are watching on YouTube please make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel and make sure that you tag all three of us if you are listening and post on story please continue to leave reviews on iTunes and because we love it when you yeah. do it's great it's a great time yeah. awesome on YouTube it's a great time yeah and we'll catch you in the next one bye bye guys